Hi everyone, it's Paul from This Design Nut. Today I'm going to talk about some of the hidden costs associated with cutting metal on your CNC. Now before we get into this, I just want to say that if you've got a budget machine, if you've got like a 3D printed CNC or one of those like 3018s that you can get off eBay and Amazon, you can cut metal on them. You know, I've seen even steel being cut on one of these budget machines. So it is possible to cut basic shapes. Let's say you need like a circle out of a, a 3 mil sheet of aluminium. Yes, you can cut it on these machines. I think that you'll quickly get frustrated like I did when you need to start thinking about things that are fitting into other things. So if you're building like, you know, products or multi-part objects or machines, robots, you know, that kind of stuff, you'll quickly probably start to think about maybe upgrading your machine or maybe thinking about wanting to cut metal more accurately and more cleaner, especially if you're thinking about like product design. Like I've got something that I want to build that I might think about selling and it needs to look good. And the finish of the cuts that you get on these budget machines, honestly, even my CNC, without some of the extra things that I've bought, the quality just isn't good enough. And this is a, well, I got it secondhand for £800, but brand new is like £1,500, which certainly isn't cheap for a CNC machine. Hopefully this will give you just a little bit of insight. If you are thinking about getting a CNC, if, if you are thinking about you want to start you know, cutting metal, you want to start making things, uh, some of these hidden costs that I didn't quite know that I would need when I started getting into CNC. So I'm going to break this up into two parts really. First of all, the things that go on the CNC directly, and then things that are kind of like behind the scenes that help you to get more accurate and better cuts. So the first and most obvious is end mills. Now probably the biggest tip that anyone is going to give you when you just get your CNC, and it's so true, is to only buy cheap end mills. The reason being is that you're going to break a lot. I have broken, I don't know, 20 to 30 end mills by now. Uh, luckily they all cost me between one to five pounds. I think it's like the maximum that I pay and I get my end mills from eBay and I get them from AliExpress from China as well. So, you know, breaking an end mill when they cost you like one pound, honestly, I don't really even think about it. It just snaps and you kind of just chuck it away. But when, you know, they cost 20, 30 pounds and you break it, it can be very, very frustrating. And, it, you know, if you think about, I would say I've broken 20 end mills and they cost 20 pound each. That's like 400 pounds worth of end mills just gone down the drain. And believe me, when you just start out of CNC, when you just get into kind of CAM, Mac free or whatever you're using, you are going to make mistakes and you are going to break end mills. So just make sure you buy cheap. So you want to buy cheap end mills, but what type of end mills do you want to buy? If you are cutting metal and aluminium is probably going to be the most popular thing that's being cut, Single flute cutters are your best friend. I've broken so many more two flute end mills compared to single flute end mills when I'm cutting aluminium. And the reason being is that aluminium is, is a soft metal and it's got a tendency to actually gum up in the flutes. And when it gums up around the flutes, it just essentially clogs up the end mill and it just snaps. Now the benefit of a single flute end mill is that you just basically have more space in the flute to evacuate the chips so they haven't got a chance of getting recut as the end mill is spinning around and just gumming up into the end mill. Another benefit of single flute cutters is that you can use slower feed rates. Now with two or three or even four flute end mills you need to move the end mill across the material much quicker because the teeth are cutting much quicker intervals. The quicker you move something, the harder it is for it to be accurate. And these like, you know, hobby machines, they can't handle the higher speeds. And also they're probably losing accuracy when they are moving or trying to move that quick. So single flute, they, they help you with two things. They help to evacuate the chips and they also allow you to use slower feed rates, which are just more friendlier for your budget machine. Now, even with using single flute cutters, I was still snapping them, especially the smaller diameters. When you start getting into like four or three mil diameter, they're very easy to snap. And the next biggest thing that will help you with cutting aluminium is air and coolant. So air will just help to flush away the chips. It will blow the chips away from the cutting area. So there's no chance of them getting recut, which as you know, will gum up in the end mill and will lead to a snap of the end mill. And the benefit of adding coolant to that air is that it obviously helps to lubricate it, which helps to reduce friction, which then helps to reduce the heat buildup. And you really want to try and keep things as cool as possible so it doesn't start to get soft and gum up in your end mill. And it also helps with tool life as well. So that is 
quite a big investment. And I've only just recently made the dive into coolant and air supply. The thing that will add to the cost of this is if you are doing it in a house. I'm guessing that most people watching this will probably be, like in my situation, you're gonna be maybe doing it in an apartment or maybe in a you know, utility room like I am. If you are in a shed or a garage, then you can usually get away with slightly louder air compressors. So you can get, you know, like a 50 liter air compressor for about 100 to 200 pounds. But if you are indoors, you really need to think about getting a silent one because your neighbors will hate you if you run an air compressor all day uh, doing machining. Now, the silent ones, they are obviously not as powerful and they usually have lower capacities. I recently got hold of a Implitex. It's a German brand. Um, so far, it's run really nicely. It's a 35 liter and it is very quiet. I can run it in here. It doesn't make too much noise. I would have liked a larger capacity, but as I said, you know, air compressors, the silent ones, they get very expensive very quickly. This was 350 pounds. And if you wanted to go up to, I think it was the 50 litre, it jumps up to like seven or 800 pounds. So it does quickly become very, very expensive. I have seen ones on Amazon. I've seen reviews of them as, as well. I think they're called Rizzo. I'm not too sure of the name of that, but they are somewhat well rated. Um, you know, it's all coming from China. So I think the quality control of a lot of these air compressors is, is hit or miss. Some people have had rust in on them. And honestly, once I saw a few videos of air compressors exploding on YouTube, I probably shouldn't have done it, but I ended up watching some of like the safety precautions of air compressors. If they rust on the inside and the tank explodes, it can be incredibly dangerous. I've got my air compressor literally just down here. When I'm machining, it's right next to my legs. And honestly, I was really scared when I turned it on for the first time because I've looked at all of these kind of like safety videos around air compressors. So I was thinking of getting a cheap Chinese one and I thought, is it worth the risk? You know, I don't want it exploding in here. So I just ended up getting one from Europe. It's, it's a German brand. It's very, very highly rated. Um, it's powder coated on the inside. The tank is powder coated, which means that it won't rust. And you know, you can't look inside the tank, so you don't really know the quality of it. Um, but these ones are powder coated. Generally, you know, the, the good ones, the high quality ones, they are powder coated on the inside. And that is very important. You want to look for that feature. So connecting to the air compressor is obviously the mist coolant. Now you can get these very cheap off eBay. The biggest tip for mist coolant is make sure that you get one with two valves. It's about five pound more compared to the ones with a single valve. Uh, I did have one with a single valve and I, and I sent it back because the reason is, is that you don't have fine control over the level of coolant and air coming into the, into the blower. And basically what that means is you've only got the air supply to change and it's just too difficult to adjust the amount of coolant. It was either I have it no air at all and no coolant was coming through or I have enough air coming through and loads of coolant was being wasted. It was blowing out so much coolant. With this one, it's like five pound more. It's got two valves on it, so I can adjust the amount of coolant and I can adjust the amount of air. Sometimes you might want a lot of coolant if you're doing a really deep pocket. Sometimes you might not want a lot of coolant, but you want a lot of air if you're doing like you know, a side contour around a bit of metal or something like that. So having dual valve is the way to go. A little bit more expensive. There are more expensive versions. You can get like a Noga mist coolant head. You can get, I think Fogbuster is a very popular brand, but you yeah, know, they start getting into the hundreds. And for what probably most people are using at home, one of these Chinese cheap mist coolants do the job. Now, if you're in the UK, um, I've actually fortunately found a company that do mist coolant. If you look on all of the forums, uh, lots of people will recommend the Cool Mist 77. And I usually like to use what other people are using because I don't really know what I'm looking for. But thankfully, I got in contact with them. I said, hey, I'm looking for something like the Cool Mist 77 solution, something I can dilute and just uh, use with water. They recommended this. I've done a few cuts in it and it really does improve the, the finish of the cut. So if you're in the UK and you're looking for Miss Coolant, I will put a link in the description for that. They've got an eBay store. They've also got a website as well. I bought like a litre bottle of it and it's probably going to last me for years because you dilute it down to like 3% concentrate. So yeah, it lasts a very, very long time. I mean, a really good example of how coolant can really help is yesterday I was cutting this deep pocket. This is like... 25 mil deep and I was cutting it with a three mil diameter single flute end mill. Now if I did that 
probably even with just air, it would have snapped the end mill. If I did it with nothing, it, it would have 100% snapped the end mill. But I flooded it with this coolant and it did the cut. It didn't snap. And even though right at the end, it was grinding, I could hear where the chips were right at the bottom of it, um, but the coolant really did help with that cut and I managed to finish it without breaking anything. So if you are looking for a nice finish, I would say that you know coolant is very, very beneficial for that. You know, you can do flood coolant, you can do mist coolant. I think for most people with these budget CNC's, you're gonna be looking at mist coolant. You can avoid coolant, you can just use air, and that will just essentially help to blow away the chips. So you won't have any recutting. Now, the last thing that goes on the CNC is a vice. And this is the last thing that I'm yet to buy. Now, I bought this off eBay, and it was labeled as a CNC vice. It's not, it's just a drill press vise. Now, the problem with this is that when you clamp it up and you clamp in your part and you clamp it tight, this moving section just raises up slightly, which causes your part to raise up slightly. It's maybe not too much of a problem, if you, again, if you're not worried about the accuracy of parts or parts fitting into other parts. That really does annoy me. Every time I know that I'm clamping it up, I know that it's raising the part. There's not really much I can do about it. So the way you get around this is you use a precision vise. Now precision vices, they have a, a jaw system that as you clamp it, it actually applies downward pressure to the clamp, which helps to keep the part from lifting up. Now this, again, this is quite an expensive investment. You can get away with a drill press vise. I have been machining metal with that drill press vise. It's really not the best. I am gonna upgrade. I'm just waiting to see what I can maybe find secondhand, but, for a precision vise, for a CNC like this, you know, you don't have a lot of Z access uh, height, which means you need to get a low profile one. You can get cheap ones, but the height of the of the vices is, is, is too large to fit into these CNCs. A lot of them, a lot of the cheap ones that are aimed at, they're like milling machines, where you've got much more uh, Z height. You can get them for like a hundred pound. But obviously, you know, it's never that easy with these type of machines. I need a low profile one. The only the only options for low profile are, as I said, a, a precision low profile vice, and that is approximately three to 400. Or you can go the route of using like a, a Saunders Machine Works modular vice, but for that you need to make a fixture plate because it's got a recessed dowel pins in the actual clamp and you put that onto the fixture. So yeah, it's, it's a really annoying kind of conundrum that I'm at at the moment. It's, you know, do I buy a precision vise or do I buy something like a modular vise, but then I've got to build a fixture plate for it. So that is an additional cost. You know, that's going to be a good three, four hundred pounds on top. Now, still talking about vices, I think you're going to want to put into them are parallels. So these are placed on either side of the, of the jaws and you just sit your part on top of them and they're parallel. So they should give you a nice flat, edge to work from. Um, I got these from RDG Tools in the UK. Yeah, they're, they're just from China. You can get all of these products all from China. These cost me, I think, 40, 45 pounds. I've just run it on my dial test indicator because I got them like a few weeks ago and they look really flat, you know, as good as what I'm ever probably going to need. So I think with a lot of these, a lot of these precision tools, the Chinese stuff, it really isn't too bad. And for the price, you can't complain. I mean, if you get like a set of parallels from Stara or whatever, one of them big brands, you know, you're paying like two, three hundred pound. And honestly, for like a hobby CNC, it's just, it's too much money. Um, these do the job and they do them good. Now, the last thing that is to do with the actual CNC is, is the enclosure. I would say this is actually the most important thing. I finally got round to building mine. You can see a link up to the build in the top here. Uh, I got mine built during coronavirus. So I just kind of knuckled down, got it done. You know, I was getting really sick and tired with walking through uh, chips in, all through my carpets and through my house. So an enclosure is so important. I wish I built it as soon as I got it. It just helps to contain all of the dust all of the chips, and also it really does help to reduce the noise. Also, it just makes it makes using a CNC much more enjoyable. You know, when you are using these budget machines and you are cutting metal, it never goes perfectly. And you're always kind of like peering in, you're always looking to see how the job is doing, if it's gonna snap or if it's starting to sound a bit weird. And without any sort of protection, it's always quite daunting to look into it. I mean, you know, it can be spinning at you know, 20,000 RPM, 
Chips can fly, parts can fly off, end mills can break. When you've got some polycarbonate between you and the CNC, you can look into it. It just feels much more safer. It feels like it's not gonna hurt me. Um, and as I said, it really does help to reduce the amount of chips that you get on your shoes and you walk through the house. So I would say if if you had to if you had to spend money on one thing apart from the actual CNC, I would say an enclosure. It's really something that you, you can't get around. Okay, so those are the things that are kind of on the CNC. Let's talk about some things behind the scenes that I have slowly picked up over the last few months as I've started to machine more and more aluminium. The first is some digital calipers. These are a must have really. You'll find yourself using them a lot. I got this one from Amazon. It's just a cheap Chinese brand. It started to play up in the last few months. Um, it's not the battery, I've already replaced the battery. Sometimes it just needs to be re-zero. Sometimes the display goes all funny and it shows me loads of different digits. I think because I will be using it so much, I will probably invest in a in a good brand. Maybe a, uh, is it Mitatuyo? I'm not too sure how you pronounce that, but uh, they are pretty much the go-to for any sort of measurement device. Another thing that's made my life much easier is some Dichem, still red. This is basically just some layout fluid. So you just paint it onto your metal and then you can go ahead and you can scribe lines in it. Or if you're, you're doing like a cut on a bandsaw or something like that, you know, you can just clearly see the mark. You'd be surprised how useful it actually is. Before I had this, you know, I was just trying to mark my aluminium with like a nail or something like that. You can't ever see the line. Once you've made a mark on it, you go away and you come back and you're time to cut it. There's all different marks on the bit of uh, aluminium. Just get some of this. It cost me like eight pound it will last you probably a lifetime and it really does help you to see your lines. And to mark out your lines, as I said, I, I was using, I was using uh, screwdrivers, I was using screws, I was using nails, and they would do a pretty crappy job. Just get yourself a carbide tip scriber. This was four pound and it marks the metal really nicely. It creates a really nice crisp line. Another thing which is very important is a deburring tool. Uh, again, this costs like five pound and essentially you just run it over the edges of your part and it just cuts off all them little sharp jagged edges and it just creates a nice little smooth chamfer so you're not cutting your hands. Uh, after you've finished the cut with this machine, uh, you know, there are lots of kind of like little, little burrs on it and they can be quite nasty, they can cut your finger. So just get one of them. Uh, this is Silverline, it's like a UK brand. It's a metal handle, all metal, and I think you get like five tips with it. So yeah, really good value. Another thing I recently got was an engineer square. Uh, this is a three inch one. You do not need probably any larger than this. Do not waste your money on like a six inch or a nine inch. They're really not needed. All you're really checking is you're checking the squareness, which you'll just be using this little corner here. And you can also use it for, um, as, a, as a reference edge, if you are trying to square some stock in your vise, you can place it up against this uh, edge here and you can square your stock so you can make it nice and flat. There are other uses, but honestly, those are probably the only uses that you will have for it. This is a, a Moore and Wright. This cost me £20. Um, it's made in Sheffield, England still. And this is a grade B. Now, I think there are three grades. You've got grade 00, grade 0, and grade B. For like workshop and you know, for people who are doing it in their, in their utility rooms, grade B is all you will need. Do not think about getting grade 0 or grade 00. Those are designed for climate controlled rooms um, where you will be doing a really, really tight tolerances and measuring that you will never need to do when you are machining stuff at home. Another thing which is very useful is a is a dial test indicator this is a plunger type you can see that it, that it plunges um, this is on a magnetic base this is just an eclipse magnetic base now stupid me i didn't know that aluminium actually isn't magnetic so this was actually a complete waste of time maybe in the future when i upgrade and i've got a big milling machine with a with a uh, cast iron bed maybe this will come in use but yeah don't get one that is magnetic because you can't stick it onto anything on the bed <laughs> So in order to use the uh, dial test indicators, you want a, a granite surface plate, or you can get cast iron, but granite is preferred because it's a much more harder material, uh, much more durable as well. You can get surface plates secondhand. If you're in America, you're really lucky because I see so many on eBay uh, that you can pick up for really cheap. In the UK, I got mine for, I think, 45 pounds and the reviews say it's really good and flat. I'm actually waiting for a height gauge to come in the post so I can actually test the flatness of it. I will do a video review of that. But so far, I mean, I'm really happy with it. It's a very nice, smooth, clean surface. Now, I wouldn't say this is essential, but you will probably get into uh, tapping holes. And for that, you just need 
a tap wrench. This is just, again, this is Eclipse. This is an M5 to M12 uh, tap wrench. This cost me like four pound. And what I do is, is I haven't actually bought just like a big tap set. Um, I just buy a, a set of the size that I need. So M6 and I've got M4 and also M10 because that's what I use. Yeah, I'm probably not going to be using like M7 or M3 or M2 a lot. So I just buy a set because they come in the various different depths of the of the tapping operation. You get ones that are starter taps, you get ones that are like middle and ones that are like bottoming, which help you to just get the thread all the way down to the bottom. So that's how I prefer to do it. I've heard that the sets, they're really poor quality, so it's much better to just invest in a an okay set for just that one size that you need. Now lastly, one of the biggest investments you're gonna need, I think, is a metal bandsaw. You might you might disagree with me, but I think once you get a stock of metal and you try cutting it with a handsaw, you'll quickly realize you need something that is a little bit more uh, better at cutting metal. I had a six inch by four inch bar of aluminum that I needed to cut through. I spent two hours trying to get through it. I just gave up and but then I just invested in a metal bandsaw. I did a review of the bandsaw that I've got and um, I've been using it over the last few months and I've really liked it. Uh, you know, just example here, I'm just making a new part. You know, I've just got a long bit of stock here. I can just cut off a part. It cuts it really nice and cleanly. I like to think that I'm actually probably gonna save money in, in the long run because if I was to buy just small parts of metal from eBay, you pay much more for, this, for the smaller stuff. Once you start buying it in longer lengths, uh, the, the pricing really does come down like per meter. Like for example, you know, if, if I was to buy this block here that I need for the part from eBay, compared to buying it like this, this is like 500 mil uh, bar, yeah, I would pay much more per say like centimeter of stock compared to what this works out to. And the same goes if you buy even longer. If you buy like full length bars, if you buy like two, three meters of the stuff and you can just cut it down yourself, you save so much money because the more you buy, the cheaper it is. So I like to think that because I've got the bandsaw and I can buy bigger bits like this and I can also buy bigger off cuts uh, from eBay and from local suppliers, you know, I'm probably gonna be saving money in the long run. I'm gonna be probably doing this for the rest of my life. I really don't wanna be sawing through all of that stock by hand for the rest of my life. So I think the, the bandsaw, it cost me about 350 pounds. Hopefully it's just a one-time investment. It's a really nice portable bandsaw. I can just put it away when I need it. You know, I'm only gonna be cutting metal probably, I don't know, four or five times a year when I'm just working on projects and I've got some stuff like this to cut, but I can just use it, put it out, it's very nice and simple. So let's just recap for all of this. On the CNC, uh, cheap end mills, single flute cutters. If you wanna start getting good finishes on your cuts, think about getting uh, mist coolant. So you're gonna need an air compressor, you're gonna need some coolant, and you're gonna need a little air mister as well. And also preferably a precision vise with some nice parallels so you, your parts are all nice and parallel with the bed when you've got it clamped into the vise. Behind the scenes, you've got laying out fluid. Honestly, that isn't that essential. I just like using it. It makes me feel like I'm actually an engineer or a machinist um, and a scriber to mark the lines. You've got also a deburring tool, which is very important. You don't want to be cutting up your fingers. You've got measuring equipment. So that is just a some sort of a stand to hold the dial test indicator and preferably a granite surface plate. So you've got a reference surface um, and also a, a small, like a three inch engineer square. And if you are going to be connecting things together, think about getting a you know, a tap set for whatever you need and also a tap wrench. And then lastly, as we just mentioned, a bandsaw to cut up your bits of metal. Now, those are the things that I have found myself needing and buying since I've started to try and get into cutting aluminium well. But those are my experiences of wanting to get a good cut. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is fixturing and work holding. This is not essential because I did talk about a vice previously and for single part jobs, that will solve 99% of the issues. But when you start getting into maybe doing more complicated jobs or you're starting getting into kind of like doing multi-part jobs where you cut multiple parts in one process, then you will start looking at more advanced work holding. There's different ways to approach this. You've got things like vacuum tables where you place your part down on a vacuum table, you turn on your vacuum pump and it will just essentially clamp that piece down. This is really good for 
engraving and doing stuff on thin sheets of metal because the vacuum will help to keep it all nice and flat. But the reason why I mentioned this is because like fixturing and work holding is very expensive. Uh, I'm working on a on a part that I want to produce in a fixture. I want to make more than one version of it in one go purely because I really want to get into manufacturing. I really do enjoy kind of building the fixtures and working out solutions for it. And I've just bought some, these, these are Mighty Bite uh, Pitbull clamps. This is eight tiny little clamps. They cost me 120 pounds. Now they don't look like much, but they do allow you to do things that you might not be able to do with just a vice. And also because you can do multiple parts in one job, you do save a lot of time because you've only got to, you know, you've only got to put in the part once, you've only got to tram it once, you've only got to make sure it's level once, and then it will cut out all of the pieces. So you, you can save time. It's why you know a lot of like job shops they they build fixtures to do kind of like you know 10, 20, 30 parts in one go because you really do start to become more efficient and you can you know make money much better that way. A lot of a lot of machinists and engineers they say you know the money is in the fixturing. If you can work out ways to fixture and, and to get more parts into into one table of a CNC table and do the job in one go, the more money you can make. Obviously I'm nowhere near at that level but I just want to start practicing. I want to start experimenting because I really do enjoy learning about all of this. So that is really a whole separate video. I just did want to mention it because if you're kind of at my level where you're, you know, you're starting to machine in metal and things like that, definitely, definitely take a look at Mighty Byte. Take a look at all the various different work holding uh, and fixturing options that you've got because it's just amazing the things that you can do. Anyway, hopefully that's given you some insight into perhaps what you would need to buy aside from your CNC if you do want to start manufacturing you know producing things out of aluminium and other metals remember this is just my personal experience from getting into this and also remember that you know don't be put off by this you, you do not need all of these things i think that most people will probably uh, have the same experience as me you'll probably do one or two cuts with just the base machine it probably won't come out as good as what you've seen on YouTube videos and things like that. And then you'll just start to naturally think, how can I improve this? What can I spend money on? So I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into that. If you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. Remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you later.